Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe <clears throat> this is the word of God. I believe what God says. Because it is impossible for God to lie. You know, in Hosea 4, 6, it says, God said this. He said, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. And you know, that's interesting. Uh, the world, they have this little phrase, knowledge is power. If you, if you know something that somebody else doesn't know, then you have a power over them. But when it comes to the Word of God, we need to understand there's more than one type of knowledge. There is sense knowledge, and I call that natural knowledge. That's knowledge you get from, you can go to school and you can get natural knowledge. Through experiences, you can get natural knowledge. And natural knowledge comes to you through your eyes and your ears and, and what you see around you and what you experience in life. But there is a knowledge that is higher than sense knowledge. And that is something that's only available to Christians who are born again. The world does not understand this type of knowledge because the world doesn't have access to this type of knowledge. And this knowledge is called revelation knowledge. Now you know that in the Word of God, we've talked about this many times, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says that we, we as a person, we are spirit, soul, and body. In the same way that God is three persons in one, the Father, the Son, the Word. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one, it tells us in Ephesians. Likewise, we, as spirit, soul, and body, are one. And because we are Christians, if we have that knowledge, even head knowledge from the Word of God, because that's what the Word of God tells us, we can understand some things that the world can't understand. See, the world just thinks, you're you, and that's it. When you die, you are dead. When you go to the hospital, there's just one you. But with us, there's spirit, there's soul, and there's body. And this revelation that comes to us now, now follow me on this, because this, this could sound confusing, but we're going to simplify it. This knowledge that comes to us that is revelation knowledge, it comes in an area called your heart. Now, of course, we know that there are places in the Scripture where it talks about the heart and the spirit as kind of being the same thing. But generally speaking, your heart is the field where the seed is stored. I, Mac Hammond told me this one day, and I really love the way he said it. He said, your heart is the field. And seeds are sown into that field. And out of that field is where you live your daily life. You live your daily life based out of your heart. Now, I said you were spirit, soul and body. Spirit, the Greek word is pneuma, soul is suke, summa is body, but the Greek word for heart is cardia. That's where we get cardiac arrest, you know, that type of thing, the word cardia. You go to the hospital, you get a cardiogram, whatever. So there's three things that make up you, spirit, soul, and body, but you live out of your heart. And the knowledge that you put into your heart is what you're going to live by. Jesus made the statement. He said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Not out of the abundance of your body, not out of the abundance of your soul, not out of the abundance of your spirit, but out of the abundance of your heart. The essence of who you are. So in order to have a life where you're operating close to the way God wants you to operate, you need to have your heart filled with seed, if it's the field, filled with seed 
that grows into a harvest of something that you want. And you've heard me give this illustration before, that sometimes if you go up to somebody and you just slap them upside the head, if I brought James up here and just whacked him upside the head, you'd find real quick what's in his heart. Because he wouldn't have time to filter it through his soul. What, what comes out of your heart instantly when a tragedy happens? You say, oh, blank, blank, blank? Or, help me, Jesus. I mean, what, what comes out of your heart? Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. Let's take a look at some scripture. Proverbs 4.20 says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Now here's, here's what a lot of people do on earth. They, they look to the secular world, and, and look, everything in the secular world is not bad. Doctors are not bad. When you go to the hospital, the doctor's trying to do the same thing for you you're, you're wanting done. He, they do the best with what knowledge they have to heal you. I mean, they're, they're working for the same goal that you're working for. Whether they're a believer or not, we don't know all the time. But they are working with the best knowledge that they have to work with. As a Christian, we can have revelation knowledge beyond natural knowledge. So in order to do that, we have to incline our ears, our eyes, to his sayings. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. So, how does the seed, which Jesus said in one of his illustrations one time, in one of his parables, uh, they asked him, what did your parable mean? His disciples did, and, and he pulled them aside and he said, in this parable, the seed is the Word of God. The seed is the Word of God. So when the seed is sown in your heart, how, how does it get there? Incline your eyes to my words. Incline your ears to my words. In other words, who are you listening to? Who, who are you watching? Now there are, I watch videos on the internet, but I Guard which what videos I watch on the internet. And so you, you have to, sometimes you research things, but what comes into you has got to be the Word of God. Now at night, uh, we have a multi-story house and our, our bedroom is on the lower level. And I usually, I'm one of these people, I like to stay up and kind of like study when everything is super quiet. Well, Loretta's one of these people, she's smart. She likes to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> so, she'll, many times, many times, she'll, she'll go down and, and, and be asleep, honestly, by the time I, I come downstairs. But what is so precious is, she has the Word of God playing. Either... Uh, I mean, you can call up the Alexa app. You know, you get the little Alexa things, you know, you talk to them. I've got so many women in my house. I got <laughs> Alexa and Siri, and my daughter's name's Sherry. And I've got, I've got two Alexas up and, and a couple of I whatever things in my office. And Sherry, my daughter, she has an office about, oh, 40 or 50 feet from my office. And sometimes instead of picking up the phone and doing the intercom, I'll yell across the room and I could go, Hey, Sherry. And like right now, my, my phone goes off. My watch goes off. Cancel. Okay. So, but what's really nice is she will have an app on that's soothing. It may be worship music. It may be some soft type of music. It may be the Word of God. A couple of days ago, after I was spending the day with my mother at the hospital, I came home and, and she had the Word of God going on a uh, some YouTube video that she had found, and she had gone to sleep listening to the Word of God. You know, you just set the little controller for about three hours, so it goes off in the middle of the night. And uh, 
You know, when you are sleeping, your ears are not. And you can go to sleep at night listening to the Word of God. And you'll be amazed at what you'll wake up the next morning remembering. And sometimes it bypasses your soul completely and goes straight into your heart. So incline your eyes and your ears to his sayings. Because you need to understand this. God knows more than Dr. Fuzzy Face on TV. Okay. Verse 22, and this is talking about the words, for they are life to those who find them. And health, and that word health there, I looked it up in the Hebrew Loretta, and it means medicine or strength. Health to what? All your flesh. Well, what's this? The Word of God is healing. The Word of God is healing. You know, the number one cause of disease, uh, and I read this in a Mayo Clinic thing a few years ago, but uh, way up at the top was stress. That if a person is under stress, it affects your kidneys, it affects your heart, it affects your stomach, it affects your intestines, it affects your thinking, it affects your muscle, it, it affects your whole body. Wait a minute. What's God's plan for handling stress? Faith. Because if we have faith in God, if we truly believe what He says, if you have that so much in your heart that you you believe that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You actually, you actually believe in your heart no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. You actually believe in your heart that God's going to prosper you with long life. You actually believe it in your heart, not just in your head. It's not just some story you read and you kind of passed it off. No, you, you've meditated on his word. You've inclined yourself to his word so much that it's got down into your heart. And then... When you have that in your heart, it doesn't matter what storm comes. You'll be like Jesus. You just get yourself on my pillow and get in the back and go to sleep. Yeah. Little commercial there. <laughs> so we need to understand there's two types of knowledge. There's revelation knowledge and there is sense or what I call natural knowledge. And what you get in your heart is what you keep in front of your eyes. It's what you listen to. And once again, some of these things you've heard me say over and over and over, over decades, but I'm just telling you, what you are around affects you. If you work with people that are just constantly cursing and taking God's name in vain, even though you are a believer, and even though you don't like it, it gets in you. And then one day when you're up there on the roof and you're putting on shingles and you hit the wrong nail, what's coming out of your mouth? It's what you put in your heart. So, praise the Lord. God's good. Now, the church, we have the Word of God. And there are Quite a few of us, many of us, who have received revelation knowledge of God's Word. But just because people you go to church with have revelation of God's Word, let me ask you this, do you have revelation of God's Word? Do you really understand it? I was at the hospital the other night, and a man was telling me about a belief that he had about the Bible, and, and he knew the right scriptures, he knew the right thing, he, he went to a church that basically taught him the basics of the Word of God. But when it came to believing it, when I asked him if it was for him, he said, well, I sure hope so. No, wait a minute. He had the Word in his head because he'd been to enough Sunday school classes, but he, he didn't have it in his heart because if he had it in his heart, he would have known that Word's for me. That's my Word. When, when the Word of God's in your heart, you claim it. See, and I get so tired of people saying, oh, this name it and claim it gospel. Well, that's what it is. Hello, it's a name it and claim it. You name salvation and you claim salvation. 
You name the Word of God that talks about healing and you claim it. You name the Word of God that talks about prosperity and you claim it. You, see, too many people are naming it and not claiming it. And that's what I call head knowledge. You can name it, but you don't claim it. Why? Because it's not in your heart. If God says, I have it, here's the deal. I have it. It's just kind of like being filled with the Holy Spirit. In Luke, the Scripture says, Jesus said this. He said, if your father is evil, and he can give you good gifts, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Didn't he say that? So Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who is part of God himself, said that if you ask the Father to receive the Holy Spirit, he will give you the Holy Spirit. So then you have people come to the altar in various churches and and they'll say, oh, and they're tarrying at the altar. Oh, God, give me the Holy Spirit. Give me the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, give me the Holy Spirit. And then nothing happens, and they get up, and they leave, and they say, well, maybe next time. Or I didn't, I didn't receive the Holy Spirit. Well, why, why do you think you didn't receive the Holy Spirit? Well, I didn't fall down. I didn't run around the church. I didn't speak in tongues. I didn't get the hoops. You know, she, she gets the hoops. You know, she, I, didn't, I, didn't <laughs> I didn't get the hoops. You know, whoop, 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 whatever. I love her. She loves me too. Ushers don't let her leave. So, <laughs> but, but, but in reality, my response to that was to this person, what difference does that make? Are you seeking the Holy Spirit or are you, or are you seeking a physical manifestation? No, we seek Him. He said, well, how do I know if I've received the Holy Spirit? I said, here's how you know. God said, if you would ask, did you ask? Yes. Then he said he would give it to you. Now, is God a liar? No. Well, if he said he would give it to you, if you would ask, and you ask, do you have what he said he would give you? Boy, I tell you what, this is where the rubber meets the road. We, we've got to start believing what God says. Because the excuse then is, well, I didn't fall down. I've, I've been to churches where people get filled with the Holy Spirit and they all fall down. Well, it's okay to fall down. There's nothing wrong with falling down. But are you seeking the falling down? I mean, half the people that go and fall down are just doing a courtesy drop anyway. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? So, you guys still love me? So we, we've got we to believe what God says. If he says he'll do something, if we do something, look, he said that if we would ask and believe and do certain things, we would have eternal life. We ask and we believe and we do those certain things, do we have eternal life? What do we base that on? We base it on the fact that's what he said. Incline your ears to his sayings. Believe what he says. And, and quit falling into your traditions. I mean, traditions of men are good if God gave us those traditions. I, w I went to a church one time many, many, many years ago, and they didn't believe you were saved unless you walked down the aisle and shook the preacher's hand and they voted on you. <laughs> Hello? What scripture's that in? Oh, yeah, it's, it's a second deniability, four or five. Whatever. <laughs> All right, Proverbs 4.23, talking about the words. Keep them in your heart with all diligence, for out of it, out of what? Your heart. Out of it spring the issues of life. What's going on in your life? I'll tell you what's going on in your life. It's what's in your heart. You say, oh, no, it's not. Oh, yeah, it is. That's what the word says. Do we believe the word? For out of it spring the issues of life. Look at verse 24. Put away from you a deceitful mouth. Let no, what? Lashon hurrah, come out of your mouth. And put perverse lips far from you. 
And some people, man, you'd almost have to cut your lips off and mail them to Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, there's a time to keep your mouth shut. There is a time when you just need to zip it up and quit. Why, <laughs> why do you think it is when they had these hundreds of thousands of thousands of thousands of people walking around the walls of Jericho for all those days and without getting deep into the story just let me tell you this God said when you walk around the city keep your mouth he didn't say it that way but what translated into English he was just shut up <laughs> just walk around Jericho and shut up don't talk to anybody don't say anything when you see the big tall walls there that are so thick that they ride chariots around the top of them, keep your mouth shut. When you wonder, what are we doing this for? Keep your mouth shut. There's times when you're following God, you're doing what God says, but you just need to keep your mouth shut. I'm sorry I got so excited about that. No, I'm not sorry. I got... God wanted me to get that excited about that. <laughs> See, part of the problem is what's in your heart. If you're walking around the walls of Jericho and in your heart is the Word of God, you've been inclining, you would say things, if you could talk, you would say things like, wow, it's going to be really cool to find out what God's plan is. Wonder, wonder how God's going to do it this time. All I know is it's going to be victory. Yes. Yeah, Whatever it is, it's going to be victory. And they just keep walking. But too often people are walking around, what in the world is God thinking? Why in the world are we doing this? This is kind of like nuts, you know? They stand up there on the wall with their bow and arrows and pick us off like target practice. Who are you going to believe? All right. Verse 26, for as often as you eat of this bread and proclaim this cup till the Lord's, the Lord's death until he comes. Okay, I threw that scripture in there for one purpose, and that was this. At the Last Supper, Jesus said that as long as we did this, the bread and the cup, we were proclaiming. Now, let's just set that aside for a moment, but I want you to have this thought. He said you were proclaiming because of something you did. He was saying when you take the bread and you take the cup, you are proclaiming. Well, I always thought proclaiming was with your mouth. And it is. But you know, there's another type of language out there. It's called body language. It has to do with what you do. And sometimes your body language will speak more than your mouth language. Hmm. Matthew chapter 15, verse 16. So, here's the deal. Sometimes keeping your mouth shut is not enough. You got a Hebrew and he's walking around the walls of Jericho, and he's got his mouth shut. <laughs> he didn't say a word, but everybody looking at him knows he's thinking, we're doing stupid stuff. So you've got to keep your mouth shut, and you've got to get your body language to align, you know, because the Bible talks about people that point, wink, and shuffle their feet, you know. And you know what they're talking about. It's body language. Okay. I mean, I'm sure that there's nobody in this congregation or watching online that has ever done anything like that. But, uh. Okay, Matthew 15, 16. So Jesus said, are you also still without understanding verse 17 do you not yet understand that what enters the mouth goes into the stomach and it's eliminated verse 18 
But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from where? The heart. Not your soul, not your body, not your spirit. From your heart, that field that Pastor Hammond talked about, where the seed is sown. And you sow seed out of your spirit into that. You sow seed out of your soul into that. And by your actions, many times through habits, you'll sow out of your body into that. But we need to be sowing out of the Word of God into that. Because what you sow into that field is what you're going to harvest. You're wondering, why did that come out of my mouth? Have you ever done that before? I have. I've said something and I go, why did I say that? That was like the dumbest thing I could have ever said. Well, here's the answer. Jesus told me, that's what I had in my heart. And I have to analyze myself. Oh, come on. Certainly I don't have that in my heart. I need to start praying for crop failure. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornicators, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashing hands, unwashed hands does not defile a man. Jesus is basically saying, it's not so much all the ritualistic things that we do or don't do. You know, I mean, what if we came to church one day and we received the offering at the end of the service? Or what if we didn't receive an offering? Or, or what if we forgot to do the announcements? Or what if, what if our song service just went on and I never got to preach? Hey, it's not about our structure and formality that saves us. It's about the condition of our heart and what we've placed in our heart and what we believe in our heart. So you have to believe in your heart. But to believe in your heart, you've got to get the information, and it usually comes through the realm of the soul. And see, here's another key. You decide, I decide, we decide what comes into our heart. It's okay to sit down and watch a, a, a romance movie or whatever. It, it's okay, it's okay. It, it's okay to read a book that's not the Bible. But here's the thing, if there's stuff in it that is contrary to the Word of God, don't let that get in your heart. And I would say if you start reading a book, and Loretta and I have done this before, we, we've, we found a, you know, like a, a TV series or, or a movie, and we thought, wow, this is really going to be good because all the reviews were good, and it maybe was a mystery, you know, and we kind of like to watch mystery stuff, you know. Back in the day, we would have probably been big Sherlock Holmes fans, you know, or something. But... We go to watch it, and then you're maybe like five minutes into it, and next thing you know, there's stuff coming on the screen and things being said you, you don't need to hear. And, and where we make our mistake is, well, I can handle it. I can handle that. I, I know that's not God. I can handle that. My eyes can see that. My ears can hear that. It won't affect me. It affects you. It affects you, whether you think it does or not. See, who do you think it is telling you, you can do something and it won't affect you. Who, who, is it, who is it telling you that you can sleep in the enemy camp and the enemy won't affect you? I mean, what happened to Lot? He just kept getting closer and closer and closer, closer to Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, it, it just kept drawing him in. He got out. His wife didn't get out. Once again, it says that she... She turned back, and she looked back and, and turned back and, and turned into a pillar of salt. Much like the lady down at Walmart the other day who didn't look back and didn't turn correctly, and she turned into a telephone pole. <laughs> so, all right. Matthew twelve thirty three. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, here's another place, Jesus said it, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart. Out of the evil treasure brings forth what? Evil things. 
Verse 36. But I say to you, for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Now that day of judgment that it's talking about, that's not where your salvation is going to be judged. If you're a born-again believer, you're saved. But that's talking about at the judgment seat of Christ, where the rewards are handed out after the rapture. And so in other words, now let's think through this. In other words, the things that you mumble under your breath, those idle words that you don't think mean anything, they're being recorded. And uh, Loretta was telling me the other day, and I hope I get this right, that one Jewish tradition is that there's an angel with you all the time recording everything that you say. Oh, that's, wow. We sure hope that's not true. <laughs> you, know, you know, once again, my mother, bless her heart, she really curbed a lot of things in my younger years when she said, now that you're born again, son, now that you're a Christian, you just remember every place you go, Jesus is going with you. Man, I remember being with my friends and they were getting ready to go someplace and I go, man, I can't take Jesus there. <laughs> Jesus doesn't want to go there. Well, he ate with the Republicans and the sinners. <laughs> oh, the publicans and the sinners, right, I'm sorry. Okay. How do you have a good marriage? You have right words. How do good friendships come? You have godly words. Hmm. Proverbs 15, 23. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season. How good it is. You know, people who are going through tragedies in life, you can either help or you can hurt. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I had my diagnosis a few years ago, I remember one, one gentleman said, he said, you know, I had a cousin that had the same diagnosis you, you have. I said, well, how did it turn out? Oh, he died just really shortly after that. It was a horrible death. Well, thank you for your encouragement. <laughs> Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Now here's the deal. Think of it this way. Your life and your death are in the power of your tongue. Now you think about that. You say, well, does it really mean that? That's what the Bible says. Hmm. See, most people don't really understand the power of their words. And, I, and it, I'm sharing some things today that I've shared with you many times. But I'll tell you something. If you give your word on something to somebody, don't think you can back out because you haven't signed the contract. If you're a believer, your words are your contract. And if you can't do what you say you will do, then no one's ever going to trust you. If you, if you say to a salesman, okay, Okay, you've sold me. I'm going to buy that boat, and I'm going to, I'll bring you the down payment this afternoon. And then an hour later, you find out you can get the same boat someplace else for $1,000 less. And you think, well, I, I didn't sign anything at that first place. No, you didn't. But you gave your word. And you need to follow your word even to your own hurt. Just, just let that $1,000 be a lesson to you. When you give your word, it's your bond. And so many people don't think their words mean anything. That's why Jesus said, you're going to be accountable for your idle words, the words you don't think mean anything. Your words carry life and death. I like what Charles Capp said when he was here one time. He said, when you speak your words, they're like, your words are like containers that go out. And they contain faith, or doubt and unbelief. They contain truth or a lie. Your words are containers. 
And what are you sending out? Wow. James 1.26. James 1.26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives what? His own heart. This one's religion is useless. What's, what's useless? All of your religious activities that you think you're doing for God, they're just useless if you can't keep your mouth under control. You need to bridle it. And then you need to let God have the reins so he can guide you wherever. All right. Now, listen to this. We're nearing the end. I thought there'd be applause there. <laughs> okay. Deuteronomy, which that was always a tough word for Sherry, my daughter, to say. She would always say, Deuteronomy. You know, whatever. So, Deuteronomy 1.30 says, The Lord your God who goes before you, He will fight for you according to all He did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet, for all that, you did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents, to show you the way you should go, in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. Look at verse 34. This is the one that jumps out. And the Lord heard the sound of your words and was angry and took an oath saying, Surely no one of these men of this evil generation shall see that good land which I swore to give to their fathers. What happened here? Even though they saw that God had delivered them from the the Pharaoh's army in Egypt, and even though he had taken them through the wilderness and he gave them quail and all that kind of stuff, he fed them, they still didn't believe him. See, and many of us, when I say us, I'm, I'm counting my family into it, yeah. all of us, we've seen the goodness of God over the years. We've seen places where God has delivered us out of things that were just horrible, horrible. Financial, physical, emotional, delivered us to where we're, we're normal today. Most of us. All of us. God, <laughs> that, was, that was humor. God, God has delivered us. But in all of that, what are we saying? See, these people had been delivered from all those things. And then it says they went into their tents. And in their tents, they began to complain about their situation complain about well what's God going to do why isn't God moving so quick I thought he said this I thought he said that and look at the situation we're in now and their words went up before the throne of God God heard their words and it really as we would say today it really ticked him off he became angry because of their idle words you know, and to them, they may have not thought it really meant anything. They may have thought because they were in their tent, they were in their safe space. Kind of like people after church. Somebody really irritates them in church, and in church, you go, hey, how you doing? And they go out into the car, close the door, and they think they're in their safe space. They're in the car, Whoa. you know. Let me tell you something about God. There is no safe space. There is no safe space. Your car, your tent... Whatever you want to call it, wherever you are that you think that God's not hearing you, He's hearing you. <laughs> hmm. All right, 2 Chronicles 9 3. And we're closing down here. You guys are really good. I love that. See, and sometimes a person with a sense of humor, like, like I do have, or I've had people tell me it was a senseless humor, but we have to watch sometimes in our teasing. 
because you can tease in a rough way sometimes. And uh, it's not good. You know, so we, even in our humor, we need to kind of keep it. Okay. Charles Capps told me one time, we were at a restaurant, and Loretta was there, and he said, I, ha I think I have a word for you. And I said, really? What is it? And he said, come out of him. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? Loretta? Yeah. Second Chronicles 9 3. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, and the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and their apparel, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. In other words, when she saw the magnitude of Solomon's blessings, it took her breath away. No more spirit in her. That, that word spirit there, Loretta, in the Hebrew is ruach. Okay? Just in case you wanted to know. And, uh, <laughs> and there was no more breath in her. Yes. And she said to the king, it is a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Solomon had a reputation concerning his words. Do you have a reputation concerning your words? Sadly, some people have a reputation concerning their words. I've heard it said of people, hey, that guy's a liar. You can't trust him. He never keeps his word. Let me tell you something. If you've got an appointment for 4 o'clock in Jefferson City with a whatever, a mechanic, a, a, a doctor, a, a, a politician, uh, a plumber, whatever. If you've got an appointment for 4 o'clock, here's the deal. You be there at 4 o'clock or you call and say why you can't be there. But you never leave somebody hanging. You never just let your words, oh, I'll be there at 4, and then you just don't show up and five days later you see him in the grocery store and he said, I thought we had a meeting at 4 o'clock. Oh, well, yeah, well, I was watching a movie and it wasn't over yet, or whatever. Some lame excuse. Your words, you will have a reputation based upon your words. Ecclesiastes 5.2 Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything. Let not what? Wait a minute, I thought you spoke with your mouth. Let not your heart utter anything hasty before God. For God is in heaven and you're on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Wow. That's powerful. Let your words be few. Hmm. Huh. Look at verse 3. For a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. Hmm. You know, I've said in meetings, business meetings, uh, I, I, I used to be on the board of a bank, actually more than one bank, and so nobody knows where I'm talking about right now. But there was a guy that I thought was one of the smartest guys in the world on the board. And he just never said anything. Then one day he said something, and I found out it was all fantasy. He was, <laughs> he was not, but I thought he was smart because he didn't talk too much. Let that be a lesson to you. I mean, sometimes just let your words be few. All right. All right. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. You know, good words that come out of your heart, 
will bring rejoicing. And you're going to know that you said the right thing. And you're going to rejoice in that. How many times have you said something, and as soon as you said it, you knew that, that those words came from a harvest of something that you had put in your heart that you should never have put in your heart. You know, there's a lot of other scriptures we could get to. I just don't really have time for them right now. But the Bible talks about how envy, jealousies, hatreds come out of the heart. Well, how can they come out of the heart? It's what you put in your heart. Hmm. Hmm. There's one place, one scripture, we'll not get into it, but in Malachi, or for those of you from Italy, Malachi, uh, from the book of Malachi, that uh, says God grows, when we're not speaking his word, he grows weary of it. Do you really want to make God weary of what you say? I don't think so. Hmm. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Matthew 12, 37. Hmm. Wow. Then, here's a clincher. John 6, 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Now Jesus is talking here. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. If you say what Jesus said, and Jesus said he didn't say anything unless the Father said it to him. But if you say what Jesus said, you take the scripture, you don't have to say, say it in King James English, but if you say the essence of what he says, you are speaking spirit. You're speaking into the realm of the spirit. You are changing things. You are saying things that the angels understand. The angels have a language. 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak to you in the tongues of men and of angels. There, there's a language out there that they understand. And when you speak what Jesus speaks, they're hearing you. And do not forget in Psalm 103, 20, it says, when you say what God says, the angels work on your behalf. Wow, that's powerful. Okay, so in conclusion, I'm near the end right now. Jerry? <laughs> oh, I think I'll just move on there. Proverbs 81.12. I'm going to leave you with this closing thought. And it actually is a closing thought. It says, So God gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. So here's, here's the thing. Just because you became a born-again believer does not mean that God is going to control your mouth. You say, well, well, God, the Bible says he'll tell me what to speak. That's right. He will tell you what to speak. But you are the one who speaks it. He will tell you in your heart by way of his spirit. And maybe even out of the abundance of your own spirit. You will hear what you should say. But you have a choice to make whether you're going to say what God wants you to say or whether you're going to say what your emotions tell you to say. And out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth's going to speak. It's a decision to make. And sometimes when you, when, when you know that you know that you know that this person has done you wrong, but the Spirit of God is telling you to forgive them, you've got a choice to make. And sometimes it's like, but God, I don't want to forgive them. I don't even like them. I don't like being around them. I don't like the cologne that they wear. They just irritate me. Forgive them. Sometimes you just have to, and you don't have to go to them and say, oh, by the way, because you did this, this, and this, and this, and this, I should really hate you, but I forgive you. No, <laughs> come on. 
has nothing to do with that person. You forgive them where? Where where do you forgive them? In your heart. And if you forgive them in your heart and they're forgiven there. But see, what do you put in your heart? And here, here's another key that cannot be ignored. I just have to say this. Your heart not only hears the words coming through the television and those people at work, your heart hears what you say. So you've got to quit saying, that person's a jerk. That person's an idiot. That person's a liar. They may be all those things, but don't curse them. I mean, Jesus said, hey, the, those people out there that are loony, bless them. Bless them. Well, how do you bless somebody? Now, you've you got to be led by the Spirit. You've got to be led by the Spirit. But sometimes it might be sending them a birthday card with a $50 bill in it. And they're thinking after, and they know what they did to you. They may not actually think about it every day, but they know. Deep down inside, they know what they did. They know the lies and the cheating. They know that. They know what they did. And then you send them a birthday card with a $50. You think, well, I could have given that $50 to the church. Well, you could have. But maybe changing one person's heart with a $50 bill might be more important than, you know, pastor having a new cup on his table out here. You know. I shouldn't have said that. That's not a $50 cup, by the way. Actually, someone knew that I liked blue. Blue is my favorite color. I like songs with blue in them, you know, blue Hawaii, blue on blue. I like, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I even get blue bunny ice cream. Um, I just like blue. And somebody knew that, and so they, they got me, several years ago, they got me this crystal clear blue cup. And, you know, like today, I haven't drank out of it yet, right? Are we still filming? Uh, so... It, but it's just nice having it here. And where are we going with all this, anyway? <laughs> but, <laughs> but sometimes you just need to do a good deed for somebody. And you're, you're, the evil seeds that you've had in your heart, they'll say things like, well, they don't deserve it. They'll probably take that $50 and go out and buy themselves some cigarettes and booze. And Hey, 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 stop it. Quit trying to figure out things in your own head. Do what God tells you to do. Have you ever sent flowers to somebody you didn't like? Okay, now for all of you in here who have received flowers from me, <laughs> now you're thinking, I wonder what he meant by that. <laughs> it's a love thing. Let's stand. Would you get anything today? The correct answer is yes. You know, because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And even if you didn't, you need to confess that you did so that you will. Okay, Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you the praise. We, we thank you that you have given us a way to enter into the realm of the Spirit by using your words. We thank you for life. We thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus to die for us so that when you raised him from the dead and he put his blood on the altar, we, by receiving him as our Messiah, as our Lord and Savior, that we can have everlasting life and spend all eternity with you. Thank you, Father. Bless these, your people. Bless everyone in this auditorium today. Bless everyone who is watching online. And, and for those of you who are watching this video later, this blessing comes to you. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen.